We were saddened here at Catholic Communications to learn of the passing of Rosa Del Era Smith, a parishioner of Holy Cross Parish in Springfield who has bravely battled breast cancer since 2008. In October of 2010, Terry Hegarty first presented Rosa's story on Real to Real. She was the inspiration for the establishment of the Diocese of Springfield's annual Pink Mass, which for the past three years has brought hundreds together to pray for those afflicted by cancer. We remember Rosa as a woman of faith and as a loving wife and mother. Our prayers go out to her and her family in this difficult time. Coming up on this edition of Real to Real. I'm Terry Hegarty. I'll introduce you to the Cathedral High School St. Joseph Award winners class of 2014. A local kid hits the big time. I'm Carolee McGrath. I'll have the interview with Michael Warsaw, the CEO of EWTN. And Pope Francis makes his first pilgrimage to the Holy Land. These stories and more are just ahead on this edition of Real to Real. From throughout Western New England and beyond, this is Real to Real, your window on the world around you. Here is your Real to Real host, Sharon Rulier. Hello and welcome again to Real to Real on this Memorial Day weekend, which also marks the start of Pope Francis's first official trip to the Holy Land, where the focus will be on Christian unity. As he meets with the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew of the Orthodox Church, he will carry with him a message of love, brotherhood, peace, and concern for all, especially the poor. The Pope comes to a region torn by strife, especially between Christians and Jews. It's hoped that just his presence will bring promise to a seemingly hopeless situation. Last week, we talked with some local folks who have firsthand knowledge about the challenges facing the Middle East. The three shared their thoughts on this historic visit. The region's Christian population has sharply diminished and grown increasingly precarious over the last decade especially following the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the Arab Spring revolts against authoritarian regimes, and the Syrian civil war. Deacon Stephen Marcus says he thinks that the Pope's visit to the Holy Land will be able to bring back peaceful relations. You know, the sad thing about, about Bethlehem is if you look back to 1947, 85% of the people that lived there were Catholics. And now, unfortunately, it's down to less than 10%. So it's just so sad. And I'm, I'm so hopeful, you know, when the Holy Father offers liturgy, you know, where Jesus was born, you know, at, at, the, at the holy site in Bethlehem, that it can truly change hearts. Catholic communications reporter Terry Hegarty traveled to the Holy Land during a Catholic communications pilgrimage two years ago and said there was evidence of Christian persecution in shops and restaurants in the occupied territory where Bethlehem is located. He is encouraged by the Pope's visit to the place where Jesus was born and thinks it can serve to build bridges. It's sad that, that anybody would be persecuted in, in any area, but that there's not going to be much still, if things continue the way they are, of a Christian presence. So yeah, we have great hope that Pope Francis can can go there and help remedy the situation, do something to, uh, you know, with diplomacy, diplomatic efforts, with prayer to, uh, to help Christians in the Middle East. Elms College professor Martin Peon, an expert on interfaith relations, says the papal visit will be a reminder of the need for all religions to work toward collaboration and respect. I'm delighted to see that Pope Francis is uh, making this, uh, this journey and uh, interesting also that it is uh, both to uh, Muslim communities in Jordan and to Christian communities in Jordan and to uh, Jewish and Christian and Muslim communities in, uh, in Israel. 
So this is a great opportunity to uh, further the goal of religious dialogue, religious collaboration, and a more peaceful sense. For Catholic Christians in the United States, Deacon Steve says it is important to continue to pray for peace and to live by example. I think the greatest thing that we can do is just to continue to live our faith and to continue to understand, you know, that 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 whole Middle East plays itself out on our streets. I mean, I, I live in West Springfield and you can walk you know, the streets of West Springfield and you can see Muslims and Christians living in peace and in harmony. And I think that's what, what we can do in America is be able to just educate people that even though that we have different traditions, it's the same God. And if our Muslim brothers and sisters can embrace us the same way that we embrace them, which we do, um, you know, peaceful things can take place. The Pope will travel as a pilgrim whose actions, as much as his words, will demonstrate his desire to continue the path of dialogue and friendship that has been established. To actually be where Jesus preached and to follow in his footsteps would leave an impression on anyone, including the Pope, says Terry. It, even the Pope, I think, will be strengthened in his faith by going to the Holy Land because just being there, we, we all learn in different ways, and when you're there, you've all the stories you've heard, in my case, I'm a cradle Catholic since I was born, essentially all these stories I've heard, they just come to life in a, in a different way. And you can stay informed on the Holy Father's trip, both on EWTN and Catholic TV, as they will be providing coverage. And we will have continuous reports on our news and information website, iobserve.org. And still to come on Real to Real, we'll introduce you to Springfield native Michael Warsaw, proud Cathedral High alum and the CEO of EWTN. One of them's a prince, the first prince to come into the forest since, since you interfered with my spell. And we'll preview Cathedral High School's upcoming spring theater offering. These stories and more are still to come on this edition of Real to Real. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. I'm Peggy Weber, associate producer of Chalice, inviting you to join us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. as we celebrate Brother Terry's 50th year as a Passionist Religious. Join us this week as we welcome Bishop Timothy McDonnell as our Mass Presider and Father Robert Jurger as our homilist. The Chalice of Salvation, your spiritual connection, Sunday morning at 10, here on 22 News. The annual Catholic Appeal, continuing the tradition of neighbor helping neighbor, responding to Pope Francis's call to serve with love, serving our brothers and sisters throughout life's journey, caring for the less fortunate, walking with those in need, Make your donation of time, talent, or treasure online at diospringfield.org and help us to help our neighbors in need. Support the annual Catholic Appeal. Eight Cathedral High School alumni were honored as today's leaders with the St. Joseph Medal last weekend. This annual gathering is held to benefit Cathedral High School as well as honor alumni members who have exemplified Catholic values in their lives. Terry Hegarty was at the dinner and tells us more. There was a lot for the Cathedral High School family to celebrate last weekend at the Cedars Banquet Facility in Springfield as more than 300 gathered to honor eight alumni members of the high school with the St. Joseph Medal. It's an exciting, exciting night. Uh, I'm very humbled to be honored this evening. There's some uh, amazing other honorees that are being honored tonight, and I feel very fortunate to be one of those individuals being honored. Those other honorees included Richard Delorier, class of 1978, Nicholas and Judith Fiorentino, each of the class of 1957, Mary Janizek, class of 1969, Gerald Caveney, class of 1948, Michael Warsaw, class of 1982, and sister of St. Joseph, Joyce Wise, class of 1959. Sister Joyce recognized the sisters of St. Joseph who taught her at Cathedral and paid tribute to her parents. They taught me how to love. 
to serve, to forgive, and to help. And I hope they're proud. Patrick has served as chair of the Cathedral Board of Directors for the last two years, a time when the future of the school was in doubt following a June 2011 tornado that ravaged the school's Springfield campus. Patrick, who sent his two daughters through Cathedral, says there's no substitute for a Catholic education. Catholic education, secondary education in the city of Springfield is essential. We're the third largest city in the, spring, in the, the state. Uh, I think it's critical that we continue. And I was very passionate about uh, making sure the cathedral came back here, particularly here in Springfield. And the awards banquet was held in Springfield as well. Here at the Cedars, people celebrate a cathedral while being just a stone's throw away from its Surrey Road campus. And tonight, following a long period of uncertainty, there was renewed optimism an optimism that Cathedral will be rebuilt on Surrey Road. Last March, in front of the Surrey Road facility, Bishop McDonald announced that the diocese had received the funds needed to move forward with rebuilding a facility on the East Forest Park site. Cathedral President Ann Southworth told the crowd that demolition will soon be underway and that the plan is to be in the new school by early 2017. Judy and Nick Fiorentino each received the St. Joseph Medal. They met while they were students at Cathedral and have been together ever since. Judy says that support for the school is still very much needed. When we were in Cathedral, they were building the new Cathedral High School. That was all the talk, Cathedral High School. Now, hopefully, we're going to build another new Cathedral High School and that all us alumni can get together and support Cathedral so that they can have the values and the things that Cathedral gave to us. Rick Delorier, who recently retired from a more than 26-year career with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, says that Cathedral played a large role in shaping his very successful career. Uh, the principles and the ed education that I received at Cathedral was, was the finest I could achieve anywhere at that time. And not only was it a, a, an intellectually stimulating environment in which to work, it was a spiritually stimulating environment as well, where Catholic principles and precepts were, precepts were instilled in young people at an early age that would help them be the best people they could be, not only professionally, but in their personal lives as well going forward. Rick says that Cathedral prepared him to be a good person, husband, father, and FBI agent. I was very proud to call myself a graduate of Cathedral High School, and I'll always be proud to be a Cathedral Panther. There was more than enough Panther pride to go around at the fundraising dinner and there was much enthusiasm for the future of Cathedral High School. <laughs> Reporting for Real to Real, this is Terry Hegarty. And as Terry mentioned, among this year's medal recipients was Michael Warsaw. His is the classic story of a local boy who's made it big. Born in Springfield and a graduate of Cathedral High School where he showed early signs of great leadership skills, he has gone on to lead the popular Catholic TV network, EWTN, based in Irondale, Alabama, where today he serves as the chairman of the board and chief executive officer and the pride of his home diocese. Real to Real's Carolee McGrath caught up with him during his visit to our area and asked him about his career and his faith. It was a warm welcome at the Cedars in Springfield for a hometown boy who made good and is doing good in the process. Michael Warsaw, the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of EWTN, flew in from Alabama last week to receive Cathedral High School's Alumni Award, the St. Joseph Medal. Although I have been away for some time, uh, I am at home and we are a Cathedral High School family. And while in town, Warsaw took time to pay a visit to his alma mater, inspiring teens with a line from Mother Angelica. He told them to be willing to do the ridiculous, so God can do the miraculous. A bunch of nuns in a monastery garage uh, with $200 in the bank and some sheep and goats wandering around outside on their property is not necessarily the recipe for success for a media empire. Uh, but it was because this was God's network that she was beginning. Warsaw grew up in the Pine Point section of Springfield. There he attended Our Lady of the Sacred Heart School, going on to Cathedral, where his leadership skills took shape. He was Senate President for the school's highly acclaimed Student Congress, going on to graduate in 1982. 
Warsaw then went on to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., where he studied religion and religious studies. He also did graduate work in liturgical studies. During his visit to Western Massachusetts, he toured the production facilities of his hometown diocese communication ministry, one which he has said showed him at an early age the power of the media to help spread the good news. Uh, EWTN launched uh, to the world in between CNN and MTV. Uh, so Mother was really a pioneer in the use of this emerging cable technology platform. Mother Angelica, a poor Claire nun, started the Eternal Word Television Network in Irondale, Alabama in 1981, building a studio on the grounds of Our Lady of the Angels Monastery she founded. Little by little, these, these opportunities to evangelize uh, came forward and, and we've uh, been able to take advantage of those and to be able to grow EWTN into the world's largest religious media organization. And that's tremendous. And I, I think, as I said, Mother Angelica uh, nor I ever would have uh, thought that it would become what it has become. Warsaw joined EWTN in 1991. In his current role, he's also the publisher of the National Catholic Register, which EWTN acquired in 2011. The network has children's animation, teaching series, pro-life shows, and they cover live church events. In this particular time in history when being a Catholic, particularly being a Catholic in the public square, is a very, very difficult thing, I think so many people find it encouraging and refreshing and rejuvenating to be able to sort of connect with EWTN and our content, whatever way that is, television, radio, uh, or online. They find in that a real source of encouragement. EWTN recently received a Gabriel Award for Religious Television Station of the Year. The network also won an award for EWTN News Nightly. In this current moment, I think we feel that uh, the church's voice is either being shut out of secular news uh, or being misrepresented. And I think it's more important than ever at this time that we have a solidly Catholic news program and solid Catholic news resources where people can come to a Catholic outlet to understand what the church is saying. Warsaw, who has an 18-year-old and a 13-year-old, says he really sees the youth as the hope for our church. He says they're on fire, they're pro-life, and simply proud to be Catholic. I think our children uh, are, are remarkable. And what I see in, in young people today, particularly so many of our Catholic young folks, is, is a true commitment uh, to being pro-life, um, of a really strong sense of the importance of being Catholic, the uh, importance of embracing uh, the church and her teachings. So I think the future bodes well. Mother Angelica, who just turned 91, suffered a stroke several years ago which impaired her speech. But Warsaw says he continues to be inspired by her faith and joy and hopes that in years to come, the network, which she started on a little bit of money and a whole lot of faith, will continue to bring Christ's triumphant message to every corner of the world. And I promise you that through your willingness to do the ridiculous, God will accomplish the miraculous. Reporting for Real to Real, I'm Carolee McGrath. And now another Cathedral High alum who has dedicated his life in service to the church's broadcast ministry and outreach. On September 8, 1957, Bishop Christopher J. Weldon celebrated the first televised Chalice of Salvation Mass. One of the altar servers on that day 58 years ago was then young Cathedral High School student Terrence Scanlon. It would prove providential. Brother Terrence, as we now know him, is celebrating the 50th anniversary of his religious profession as a Passionist Brother this year, of which 33 years he's been the face and the voice of the Chalice of Salvation. This past Thursday, hundreds of co-workers, friends, and Chalice viewers gathered at St. Michael's Cathedral to honor Brother Terry on his milestone. Springfield Bishop Timothy McDonald celebrated the liturgy and recently re-elected Passionist Provincial Father Robert Jerger gave the homily. To honor our colleague, we thought we'd share again a story I first brought to you two years ago when Brother Terrence marked his 30th anniversary on this weekly program. Let us pray today for the eyes.
When Brother Terrence recalls his time with Chalice of Salvation, he's got a lot to think about. The West Springfield native, who grew up near the Passionist Monastery in West Springfield, worked in the retreat house kitchen as a teenager, would eventually join the Passionist community in 1962 in Pittsburgh. For a number of those early years, he managed the community's print shops in West Hartford and Union City, New Jersey. Then, in 1981, he received a request from Passionist Father John Patrick Moore, chalice host at the time, to come back to West Springfield and work in the community's television ministry. Father John Patrick Moore extended the invitation to me. He says, why don't you come up and work on TV? And I said, I have no experience. He says, well, you're just going to get your hands wet very early. So, um, and through, it was through his encouragement and um, uh, and push and drive that uh, I'm here with you now for 30 years. When Brother Terrence first arrived, the Passionist Radio and Television Center for the Diocese of Springfield was located on Elm Street in West Springfield in what was affectionately known as the A-frame. He says people would actually show up on Sunday mornings thinking that the Mass was broadcast from there, when in fact it was produced at the Channel 22 studios on Proven Mountain in Feeding Hills. Catholic Communications Director Mark DuPont also came to the Communications Ministry in 1981. He recalls the great energy and commitment Brother Terrence brought to his new assignment. In the early 1980s, we were on the cusp of many new innovations in the broadcast and communications world. Uh, and so Brother Terry came at a very important and critical time in the history of Catholic communications, brought a great deal of energy and enthusiasm on how we could use these new technologies to really enliven the way we broadcast the Mass so it brought better meaning to the people at home. During the following years, Chalice took to the road, broadcasting remote Masses from many parishes and locations, including the yearly Big E Mass times Brother Terrence looks back on with fondness. We really show the health and wealth of the diocese, you know, the richness of the spirituality by the Let's different priests that come in that are on chalice. It's Let a reflection of the diocese through the camera him, lens, him, right back in into the their homes. And that advancement in technology has continued in recent years. We're into high definition TV now. So everything is su supremely compact. You're taking a disc now to go out and to do your stories instead of the cumbersome tapes. The longevity of the disc is much improved. And just the ability of the, of the new cameras and the graphic arts and all that it makes it a lot easier and attractive to the viewing community. And the viewing community is large, says Monsignor Christopher Conley, Vicar General of the Diocese of Springfield. I've often said to Brother Terrence, half kiddingly, but the other half rather seriously, that he is the pastor, in a sense, of the largest parish, and that he brings a pastoral presence and, and the face of the church uh, each week, each Sunday, so beautifully, not only to Catholics throughout the uh, diocese, but others who may tune in and are encouraged and uplifted by the message they hear. As Brother Terrence begins another decade of service in broadcast ministry, I asked him, what keeps him here? My New England stubbornness, I don't want to leave. <laughs>
The play we're doing is titled Seeking Sleeping Beauty, and it's a very interesting story about uh, Prince Florimund who wakes up in the forest with his companion and they're lost. Well, they bump into Lilac, who is a prince or a fairy, and she tells him the story of this sleeping princess. One of them's a prince. The first prince to come into the forest says, Since you interfered with my spell. And they've been waiting a hundred years for a prince to come into the forest to kiss the sleeping princess and wake her up. Well, the problem is nobody knows how to find the castle where the princess is. So in their travels to find this castle, they bump into a number of different fairy tale characters, Little Red Riding Hood, they run into the little old lady in the shoe, Hansel and Gretel, Dracula, and a number of others, and they have some uh, very funny, interesting things happen to them on their way to Waking Sleeping Beauty. Senior Mary Ayamo plays Sleeping Beauty and also designed the show's costumes. There are several fairy tales that are involved in this story, and they're uh, very uh, the, the classically known fairy tale characters. So it kind of just went off the classic images of them when I uh, drew up ideas for the costumes, and um, then we look to our costume closets and see what we had to fit the roles. Set designer Annie Rodriguez tells us what we can expect to see on stage at City Stage. So a lot of outlandish designs. We have a shoe for the little old lady who lives in a shoe, which is a very big piece. It's about 12 feet long, 10 feet high. We have a castle and we have the gingerbread house. There I was, enjoying the sight of Prince Sarah quietly dying. The show is for children and adults alike and will be playing at downtown Springfield City Stage next Friday and Saturday, May 30th and 31st, starting at 7 p.m. Tickets are $12 for adults, Eight for students and seniors. Children six and under are free. Parking is available in the parking garage for $7. For advanced tickets, call CHS at 782-5285 or go to cathedralhigh.org. I'm Julie Bollier reporting. And again, you can catch that theater offering next weekend at City Stage in Springfield. And these talented students like this program benefit from your generosity to the annual Catholic Appeal. There are 40 agencies and services helping the young and old alike, people at every avenue of life who depend on the annual Catholic Appeal and the ministries it supports. The Appeal is now in its final weeks of its active campaign, so it's very important to hear from everyone. Please consider making your donation today online or through a link on our website at iobserve.org. There you can also find all of the latest news on the Catholic Church locally and around the world. That's iobserve.org. And thank you in advance for your support of the annual Catholic Appeal. For this week, that's Real to Real. Please join me again next week for another edition of Real to Real, your window on the world around you. We close this Memorial Day with a tribute to all who have given their lives in service to our country. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation, funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal, and the support of you, our faithful viewers.